Hi, so we've got a massive new climate report hot off the presses. If you're bracing yourself for some catastrophic news, well, that's kind of the good news. There's nothing new in this report. There's no new bombshells that we didn't already know. We expected this, all of this. We're seeing the effects of climate change already, and this report just confirms what our research and experience has told us is happening. What we've got is several thousand pages of research compiled by hundreds of scientists that tells us exactly what the Earth's climate looks like right now and what the future might hold. And well, it isn't really an optimistic read, but it does represent an impressive collaborative project amongst the 195 countries that are members of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it creates one definitive place to go to for an up-to-date, comprehensive understanding of the climate crisis. So far, we've only got the section about the physical science basis. The next two chunks of the report on the human impacts and how to respond are coming in 2022. So uh, what's even in this thing? Well, I spent my weekend reading through all the jargon and here are my highlights. For starters, the IPCC is using definitive language. In the summary for policymakers, the shorter, easier to read, um, summary of the report, which importantly is approved line by line by the 195 governments in that intergovernmental part of their moniker, uses words like unequivocal a bunch. As in, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Or observed increases in well-mixed greenhouse gas concentrations are unequivocally caused by human activities. This is a big deal because normally the IPCC sticks to more cautious language like medium or high confidence, which is still their primary way of expressing uncertainty, but where the science is definitive, they're letting it be definitive. Climate change is human cause and is having a tremendous impact. This obviously isn't new information, but it does mean that governments from the United States to Russia to Micronesia to Libya have all signed off on an agreed set of facts relating to the climate crisis, who caused it and how bad it is. And that's kind of a theme of this report. There isn't any new science here. It is just a roundup of everything we know right now, or more accurately, everything in the scientific literature published before January 31st, 2021. For example, we know each decade since the 1980s has been warmer than the last, and as a result, global surface temperature has risen a little more than one degree Celsius since 1850 because of human activities, burning fossil fuels. We also know that all of this human-caused climate change is messing with the water cycle, changing rainfall patterns, storm tracks, and even the saltiness of the ocean. There is no place on Earth that is free of these impacts. Every region of the planet is already experiencing and will increasingly experience climatic changes. What do those changes look like? Decreases in permafrost, snow, glaciers, ice sheets, lake, and Arctic sea ice. Increases in extreme heat events that can impact everything from agriculture to human health. Intensification of tropical cyclones and extratropical storms. River floods, fire weather, increased overall rainfall, and increased dryness. Not to mention, as more people continue to move into cities and cities and urban infrastructure get larger, the severity of heat events, extreme rainfall, and flooding increases in those places. <sighs> All of which means that the melting of permafrost and erosion of land in the sea threatening homes in Alaska, the extreme heat in the US Northwest and Pakistan's Indus Valley this summer, supercharged cyclones like Hurricane Harvey in 2017, and droughts like those in the US Southwest and Madagascar are more than likely going to increase in severity and frequency. Of course, these are physical changes in the atmosphere and oceans. How these physical changes in the Earth systems impact people, how governments choose to respond to these events, and who and where gets protection, that's a decision but I'm getting ahead of myself. How and where these impacts are most likely to occur is regional. While the global average temperature is increasing, the weirdness and bumpiness of the planet mean different areas aren't all experiencing climate change the same way. Helpfully, along with the support, the IPCC also released a website where you can explore the projections for where you live. If you like pretty graphs that make you cry, this site is for you. Plus, you can download that sweet, sweet raw data. Probably the scariest sentence in the summary for policymakers to me is, if global warming increases, some compound extreme events with low likelihood in past and current climate will become more frequent. And there will be a higher likelihood that events with increased intensities, durations, and or spatial extents unprecedented in the observational record will occur. Now, perhaps that word salad does not inspire deep fear in your soul, but breaking things down a bit. So a compound extreme is the jargony way of making the nightmare scenario of two or more hazards happening at the same time or one after another not sound horrifying. So for example, a heat wave happening in a region already dealing with a drought, or a wildfire followed by a massive storm, or a wicked cold snap right after a flood. By definition, these extremes are extreme. They're rare. So what they're basically saying here is these dangerous rare events, well, they're not gonna be so rare 
anymore. And while one extreme event can already stress many places' emergency management systems, resources, and response, adding another one on top of that can be devastating. It's a bit of a one plus one equals way more than two in terms of how we're able to prepare and respond. What this report makes really clear, there is a big difference between if temperatures rise by 1.5 or 2 degrees, and everything beyond. The expected impacts and effects of warming only get worse as the thermometer creeps upward. For example, right now, extreme heat events occur nearly five times as often as they did historically. With 1.5 degrees rise, we're looking at nine times as often, and at 2 degrees, 14 times as often. This is the same story for fire weather to droughts to heavy rainstorms and flooding. Reading this report is basically a lot of bad news all in one place. We're seeing confirmation of the relationships between the dreadful fire seasons, massive flooding, horrifying cyclones, and widespread rapid climate change. And the IPCC has laid it all out for the world to see. But physical climate impacts are not a guarantee of the apocalyptic end times. We know how to respond to environmental hazards. Floods and storms and heat and fire are not new. They're coming more often, and they're supercharged, and they're intense. But over the last hundred or so thousand years that people have been roaming around on this rock, we've developed the skills and tools and expertise to protect one another. We also know what we need to do to reduce emissions. While this report outlines that there is only an inside chance in the future scenarios that keep the globe below 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, it is still possible. We just need the changes right now. Not in 10 or 5 years, but right now. Every fraction of a degree of warming avoided, every push for cleaner air and water, will reduce the number of people and places impacted. If you've heard the alarm the IPC has sounded and activists have been ringing for decades, I encourage you to get involved. This report has nothing in it about solutions. The impacts and vulnerability and mitigation and adaptation reports aren't coming out until 2022. This report and the news around it are a lot. It is hard to hear and read about these objectively disastrous scenarios. But we've got a set of facts, we've got piles of data, and we have the knowledge to deal with this mess. And one of those tools can be this report. I encourage you to send the summary for policymakers to your government representative. Chances are, you live in one of the 195 countries that signed off on it. Let your rep know and ask, what are they going to do with this information in your community? You can also hop on over to the Atlas and take a look at what the current and future climate impacts will look like in your region. Do the models suggest future drought? Take that information to your community board, town halls, or governors. Or join a local environmental organization and explore the data together. How can you use the knowledge in this report to start building solutions where you live? And if the news around this report is feeling really overwhelming, I've left a few links about dealing with climate despair downstairs too. Thanks for watching.